Uh, and the song is also a very appropriate one, but for the grace of God. You know, sometimes we take life for granted. We just say, I'm going to church, I'll be back. Who said we'll be back? A few years ago in the Bible, Joseph bade farewell to his father. I'm going to deliver food to my brothers, I'll be back. I'll be back took almost 20 years. Who said we would have uh, made it even last night? We came to church. Who said you could have sat through Sabbath school to divine service? If there is any lesson we draw from Brother Robert's situation, it is simply that it is just an act of grace alone Amen. that has sustained us and kept us. I think, uh, Brother Robert, you want to give us an update? In good spirit, but of course uh, has to be concerned. Okay. We're trying to keep him as calm as possible. Someone is accompanying him to the hospital. We will keep uh, in touch to find out what's happening and give the church an update later. Amen. Let's continue to keep him. Life is so fragile. Amen. Let's be thankful for the grace of God. Amen. Life indeed is fragile. And we are not just talking about our physical and emotional health, but even our spiritual health. And that is what this weekend is all about. We are attempting to find a cure, a healing for an ailment. And this afternoon, you are going to discover we all have contracted a very deadly condition. It is called self. Is far worse than heart attack or AIDS or cancer. This is a cancer of the soul. It is eating us all up. It is going to destroy us. You are going to discover in the afternoon this condition has affected angels. It has affected kings. It has affected priests and princesses. And it has affected all of us. The only way out of this is complete eradication since we can't prevent it. In cancer, you need prevention. Then you need early detection and complete eradication. In the case of the cancer of the soul, which is the root of our problems, we have already been infected, so you can't prevent it. So what we need is early detection and also how to eradicate this condition. And humility is heaven's cure to the root cause of our problem, the cancer of the soul. This hour, we're continuing with our series with a message entitled, Surrender Your Right. Amen. Surrender Your Right. Last night, we discovered when Jesus emptied himself, he literally surrendered his right, his prerogatives as God, by choosing not to exercise them independently of God. And that whatever he did, he did with the sole permission of God the Father. And this hour, our message would be, you also surrender your rights. And we are going to discover the reason to surrender this right is for love's sake. Yes. Amen. See, everyone talks about love, but do we really know what love is? You cannot talk about love unless you know of humility. If you see a skyscraper, the height of that skyscraper is determined by the depth of its foundation. Humility is the foundation. Love is the height of Christian virtue. Amen. Another way of looking at it is the fruit and the root. If you want to know how a fruit would be like, check its root. Humility is the root and love is the fruit. And later this afternoon, I'll be sharing with you uh, my latest book, 
titled, This is Love. It is dealing with closer relationships, deeper love, and higher spirituality. You cannot talk about love unless you know humility. You cannot talk about faith unless you know humility. You cannot talk about joy. You cannot talk about peace. You cannot talk about any of the Christian virtues unless you know something about humility. And that is why this hour, we're going to take some time to continue our studies on humility, which is heaven's keel for the cancer of our soul's self. Our message is entitled, Surrender Your Right. Surrender Your Right. You see, America is a nation of rights. When we talk about right, what we mean is a privilege you have, a prerogative you have, something you have by virtue of your birth or nationality. So everyone has some right. It is something due to you either by the legislation of a law or by tradition or by nature. I'm defining for you what a right is. A right is something you have as a legal claim or title. In fact, the American Constitution, the Bill of Rights, even talks about rights. It talks about it as an inalienable right or sometimes unalienable right. This is a right that cannot be transferred. It cannot be repudiated even by the president. It cannot be forfeited. We call it unalienable right. And the Bill of Rights says that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Rights which cannot be revoked, it cannot be forfeited, and it cannot be transferred. And then it goes on that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My concern is the phrase unalienable rights. We also have what we call civil rights. These are rights you have by law. And if anyone takes it away or tramples upon it, you have a legal recourse to it, and we call it you can sue them. Injustice occurs when your rights are trampled upon. And many of us have suffered unjustly. We have been experiencing things we shouldn't. America is a nation of rights. Teachers have their rights. Students have their rights. Different classes of people have rights. So we talk about women's rights. Even children have rights. I didn't know children have rights until I came to this country. In Africa, if a child messes up, you, 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 you give them some spanking. In America, you have to think twice. Because the person can say, I have my rights, I'll call the police. Children's rights. We have gay rights. Animals have their rights. Everyone has some rights. We are a culture of rights. And by the way, Ellen White says very clearly, and perhaps I should read it to you. Messages to Young People, page 421. The Lord Jesus demands our acknowledgement of the rights of every man. Men's social rights and their rights as Christians are to be taken into consideration all are to be treated with refinement and delicacy as the sons and daughters of God. What this means is a Seventh-day Adventist Christian must recognize and honor the right of every individual. The gay community has rights. And it is our responsibility to honor their right, even their right to be wrong. 
Because their right to be wrong is that gives you your right to be right. People have a right to worship even stones or animals. It is their right. And we must honor those rights. I repeat again, their right even to be wrong is the same right that gives you permission to honor what you think is right. We have a responsibility to honor the rights of every individual. If that is clear, say amen. amen. But you are going to discover this culture of rights is infecting the church and slowly the church is becoming a community of private interest groups, everyone insisting on their rights. Insisting on one's rights, if we are not careful, can affect your salvation. That is why today, in this presentation, I'm going to present to you a message titled, Surrender Your Rights. We have some handouts for you, which I trust you would follow alone. I would invite the ushers to pass out these handouts. It's a two-page handout. What I have just shared with you in the past couple of minutes are found in the first column, a definition of rights. And then I have a statement there uh, which says we have rights and we must respect the rights of others. In fact, testimonies to ministers, page 281, we are told every human being has been bought with a price and as God's heritage, he has certain rights of which no one should deprive him. And then the, the last statement in italics, which is being passed to you on your left-hand column, there are certain rights that belong to every individual in doing God's service. No man has any more right to take these rights from us than to take life itself. And then she goes on to discuss those rights that we all have. The basic point is we have rights and we must respect the right of every individual. But notice the key thought of the message which is summarized on the left-hand column under key thought. And it reads, insisting on one's rights, even one's rights as a Christian is evidence of self or pride. Yes, you have rights. But insisting upon your rights can be an indication of self or pride. It also indicates that we do not fully understand the humility of Christ, nor do we really know him. Because last night we discovered Jesus surrendered his right. Even his right as God. The indiscriminate exercise of rights can be a violation of the gospel of Christ and can cost us our salvation. A true Christian is always willing to surrender his rights for the sake of Christ. Surrendering one's rights is an indication of true humility. The message this hour will challenge you because it is very likely that somebody is seated here who has been hurt. Your rights have been trampled upon. You have been ill-treated. And there may be somebody who will say, I will never forgive him or her for the way they've taken advantage over me. Perhaps you are a young lady. Someone promised to marry you took advantage of you, and now has left you in a situation scarring your life forever, you are hurt and you do not want to forgive. Perhaps someone has defrauded you. 
You gave so much to someone and yet they turn around and hurt you so badly it is eating you up. This message is directed to you that for God's sake, surrender your right. Amen. It could be a family that is fighting, perhaps attempting to split up at this very moment. Because in the course of that relationship, Somebody's rights have been taken away. The message goes for you. Surrender your right. Amen. Following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to urge you. Surrender your right. And I'll give you reasons why you've got to surrender your rights. And the ultimate reason is for love's sake. Before we go any further, I would invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we invite you this moment to speak to us as we probe into this subject in our series, Cancer of the Soul. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study is going to be based on... First Chroni uh, Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. It is one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible dealing with rights. In fact, six times in this chapter, it talks about rights. But in the King James Version, the word for rights, uh, it is translated power. It is the, the, the Greek word exousia, which is interpreted as the authority a person has or the exercise of that authority. So sometimes the word can be translated as power, but in modern versions, they appropriately translate it as right. You'll find it in verse 4. Have we not power to eat. That word power is the word right. Don't we have a right to eat? Verse 5, have we not power to lead about, sister? Verse 6, or I only and Barnabas have not we power, have not we the right? You find the same right or power in verse 12, right in the middle of verse 12. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, this right. You find it uh, again uh, uh, in verse 15, right. Six times in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it talks about right. And by the close of the message, you are going to discover, though the argument would be, yes, you have right, but surrender your right. Uh, let me give you a little background to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Actually, this chapter begins really from chapter 8, and it goes all the way to chapter 10, and then chapter 10 actually ends in chapter 11, verse 1. Remember, in the Bible times, there were no chapter headings, so actually chapter 10 should have ended in chapter 11, verse 1, be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. What Paul is going to talk about, surrendering one's right, he says, I, Paul, surrendered my right, but what I did, I was simply following the example of Jesus Christ, who surrendered his right. Therefore, be followers of me, Paul, as I did concerning or uh, follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 8, the apostle is discussing meat offered to idols. And to summarize that chapter, this was what happened in the church of Corinth. Corinth, the church, was in a cosmopolitan area. It was a Gentile territory. Many of the people used to worship pagan idols. And then they became Christians. And the question that they posed to Paul was this, Paul, if one of my pagan neighbors, these are the Christians in Corinth, they wrote a letter and sent it to Paul. Paul was in Ephesus, and then they wrote to him a series of questions they had, new believers. Brother Paul, 
I am now a Christian. What should I do if my pagan neighbor invites me to his church? His church happens to be a pagan idol temple. If he invites me to church, let's say they have a baby dedication, or let's say my co-worker is getting married, and they got married in their pagan churches, pagan temples, idol churches, should I go to that idol temple? Because right there in the pagan temple, after they offer the animal sacrifice to God, the priest will give back part of the meat to the, to the worshiper. And then within the church's fellowship hall, they cooked a big meal, a big potluck, and they partook of the meal. And so the question is, should I go to the pagan temple and eat this meat? Let's say it is a cow that has been killed or some uh, chicken or whatever. Should I eat these meats which have been offered to idols, but part of it is now served for potluck? Should I go there and eat? What if I don't go there and eat and they bring this meat out of the temple and then the person serves this meal in his home. He has the potluck. He's an unbeliever, an idol worshiper. He calls a potluck for his home and he invites me, a Christian. Should I go and eat this meat offered to idols? What if part of the meat is sent to the market, the grocery store in that area? Should I go and buy the beef? in the grocery store, knowing very well that this beef had previously been offered to idol. Do you understand the problem? What would Paul answer be? Remember, this chapter is not talking about, should I eat pork? It is not talking about clean or unclean. This is talking about clean meats, but which have previously been offered to idols. I want to make it clear. I hope we are together. So what should Paul's answer be? Paul gave a three-pronged answer. In chapter 8, he begins from verse 2. And if any man thinks he knoweth anything, he knoweth not as yet as he ought to. But if any man loves God, the same is known of God. Verse 4, as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other uh, God but one. For though there be that, that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing of offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commends us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if a man sees you which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend... I will eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother offend. Let me explain. Paul says, look, concerning these meats offered to idols, we all know that idols are wood and stone. They are lifeless. There is no power in them. Consequently, if I'm bidden to go and eat meat offered to idols, quite frankly, I can. Because they are wood. Having offered it to idols doesn't make the food in any way less nutritious. So I will. But then he said, there is someone out there whose conscience is weak. When they see you, let's say, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, right there in a pagan temple, 
eating those meats offered to idols, they would say that, oh no, this Christian, now they are worshipping idols. And consequently, because of the knowledge you had, you thought, oh, no big deal, I can eat whatever I want. That knowledge you have becomes a stumbling block to somebody. His conclusion, therefore, is this. I will not go in there and eat meat offered to idols, though I know there's no big deal. If eating meat will cause one brother to stumble on his way, I will not eat meat as long as this world lives, I surrender my right to eat meat offered to idols. You, you, you see the context? Yeah, yeah. Then to make the point that I am urging you to surrender your right, he divorced chapter 9 to say, look, this instruction I'm giving you is not something I am not practicing. As a matter of fact, I, Paul, though I am an apostle and I have a right to be, to be paid by the conference tithe money, I surrendered my right. And then in chapter 10, he continues with the discussion by saying, okay, we already know, don't go inside the temple to eat these meat offered to idols. What if it is brought home to be eaten? Well, if you go for the potluck in that person's home and you are served, let's say, with beef or chicken or whatever, eat. Don't ask any questions. But if your host tells you, Brother Robert, this beef in this soup or stew came from a pagan temple, then for the sake of Brother Robert who has called your attention, don't eat. What about if the same beef has been sold or is being sold in the grocery store? Should I eat or should I buy it? The same counsel he gives, you find all this in chapter 10. He says, when you go the same place and they tell you this beef came from this pagan temple because it has been called to your attention and people would misunderstand you if you buy it, don't buy at all. But if no one calls your attention to it, just buy it because we already know that these wood and stones have no power in them at all. This is the context of this discussion. I hope we are clear. Amen. Now let's go, come back to chapter 9. A fascinating chapter that if we understand will radically change your attitude to life because many of us are hurt. Many of us are going to be hurt, to be defrauded, will be abused in ways that the only way you can move on in life is to surrender your rights. In chapter 9, which will be the subject of our discussion, Paul is defending his right as an apostle. You see, one of the hardest things that anyone can face comes from Christians. Your worst problem in life comes from people who have been very close to you. Church members, family members. In the case of Paul, what happened was, wherever he went to preach the gospel, there were false believers who always trailed him. And then they would misrepresent him and try to, you know, brainwash people against him and discredit his message. And they had met this in the church in Corinth. It was Paul who established this church in Corinth. But while he was gone, people sneaked into the church and started saying, Paul is no true apostle. He is pretending to be an apostle. He is an imposter. He doesn't have the credentials. He wasn't called by the Lord Jesus. Jesus had only 12 apostles. They are the real apostles. Paul is none of them. And that is why he is not paid by the tithe money. He is not supported. Have you seen an apostle working like Paul? He preaches during the daytime. Then in the night, he has to work on his tent to raise money to support himself. If he were a real apostle, how come they are not paying him? 
So ladies and gentlemen in the church in Corinth, don't follow anything Paul has said. He is no apostle. That is why he is not being paid. And so Paul had to respond to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. He begins by asking a series of questions. They are called rhetorical questions. The answer to all these questions is yes. He says, am I not an apostle? The answer is yes. Am I not free? Free to do whatever I want? Yes, Paul, you are free. Have not I seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Let me just pause it. To be an apostle, you must first see the Lord face to face. The twelve saw Jesus face to face. And Paul says, I also am an apostle because I also saw the Lord face to face. On Damascus Road. So the first quality of an apostle I have fulfilled. The second quality of an apostle is they must be sent by the Lord. They must be commissioned by the Lord to do his work. Paul also says in verse 1, the last part, that are ye not my work in the Lord? The evidence that I'm an apostle is you church members in Corinth. I came here preach the gospel, and establish this church here. I am an apostle. That's first Paul's response. Verse 2. If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are you in the Lord. Others can question my apostleship, but not you, Corinthians. I took you from your pagan background, led you to Christ. So why do you believe this lies about me? I am an apostle. And consequently, as an apostle, I have every right to be supported by the tithe money. Then the question is, Paul, if indeed you are a true apostle, how come you are not being supported by tithe money? Why do you have to work on your own self-supporting ministry to survive? And in verse 3, Paul says, my answer to them that do examine me is this. I want you to picture for a moment, for the first time you are going to see how a lawyer presents his case. If there are any lawyers here, this chapter would mean so much to you. Pretend for a moment that Paul has been brought before the law court. The judge is over there. And the judge says, Paul... You have been accused by your enemies that you are no apostle. That is why you are not being paid by the tithe. What do you say? And Paul stands up and say, your majesty, is that how we say it in America? Or your lordship or your highness? How do you say it in America? Your honor, honor, okay. Your honor, my answer to them that do examine me is this. He is coming to present his case. On your handout, Paul from verse 3 is coming to make some assertions saying, your honor, I am an apostle and I have right. Verse 3, have we not power to eat and drink? He says, because I am an apostle, I have every right to eat and drink from the tithe money. Verse 2, oh sorry, verse 5, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? What he's saying is, as a true apostle, I have the right to travel with a wife. Just like the other apostles, Peter and the rest, their wives traveled with them. So that when they got sick, Their wives took care of them. They cooked food for them. They washed their clothing for them. Paul says, I also have a right to do the same thing, just like Peter and the rest. Oh, by the way, Roman Catholics claim Peter was the first apostle, the first pope. At least in this text, the first pope got married. Peter. So if Peter was the first pope, as the Catholics claim, and he got married, why is it that subsequent popes and priests don't get married? That's another subject altogether. But the point is, Paul says, I have a right to eat and drink to be paid. 
I have a right to travel with my family and be supported. Barnabas and I uh, uh, cannot be uh, dismissed as if we have no right. Verse 6, I only and Barnabas, or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear. So his first point, which is in your notes, Paul's claim to certain right. Now, he is coming to give reasons. He has already established I'm an apostle, therefore I should be paid by tithe. Now, listen to the evidence Paul presents for his rights. You find this in verse 7. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who plants a vineyard and eats not of the fruit? Who feeds a flock and eats not of the milk of the flock? Paul is going to offer some proof that he has a right to be supported by the type. And the first proof he gives comes from everyday life. He calls attention, first of all, from warfare. He said, every soldier who goes to battle is supported by the nation. Right now, American troops are in the Middle East. No soldier in the USA is not paid. Am I making sense? Yes. If you are a soldier enlisted in the U.S. military, you must be paid by the government. Paul says, I am a soldier of Christ. Consequently, I have right to be paid by tax money, tax money being your tithe. That's his first argument. Then he calls attention to another using uh, from uh, a farmer. He said, which farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't eat of the fruit? Basically, every farmer, when they grow plants or crops and fruits, they eat of the fruit. His point is, this church is God's vineyard, God's garden, God's orchard. Consequently, as a farmer in God's vineyard, I have the right to be supported by you. Are you following his argument? Then he calls attention to a shepherd. Every shepherd eats from the flock. They drink the milk. They eat the meat. They use the leather, the wool. And his point is, the church is God's uh, flock. I am the shepherd. Therefore, I have a right to be supported by the type. If anyone is doubting whether Paul has a right, he calls everyday experience saying, I have right. If that is clear, say amen. amen. He doesn't stop there. He calls his second witness, Your Honor, I've just argued my case using everyday experience that I have the right to be supported by the type. Let me call the second witness. And the second witness he says, I am going to call upon the Bible itself. You find it in verse 8. Say I these sins as a man, or saith not the law the same thing? When he says the law also says I have a right, the law he is referring to is Old Testament scriptures. Because in the next verse, he quotes from the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of an ox that treads out corn. When you go back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 25 verse 4, it is said that if you are a farmer and a, a bull or a cow or something is treading your corn, don't muzzle its mouth, don't tape its mouth. Give it permission to eat. And Paul is saying the principle there means anyone who is working must eat from that which he is working with. Are you following? Yeah. So his argument number two as a lawyer to make the case, I have right. First, everyday experience says I have right. Second, the Bible says I have right. Then he appeals to the, fourth, uh, the third evidence from logic. You find this in verse 10 and 11. Or save this all together for our sakes, for our sakes know that this is written, that he that plows should plow in hope, he that treasures in hope should be partaker of this. So verse 11, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? 
The fourth point, I call it proof from common sense. What Paul is saying is, your honor, if a person is a mechanic and he works on your car, you pay him so that he doesn't have to fix your car and then go back to do something else to eat. Common sense tells us that everyone eats from the labor they invest in their work. Uh, am I making sense? Yes. If you are a teacher and you are taking care of all our children in school eight hours a day, you have common sense dictates that the tuition paid by the students or the government should take care of you. If you are a physician, your patients pay to take care of you. So Paul is saying, I am a minister. When you are sick, I pray for you. I conduct your wedding. I bury you when you die. I visit and counsel you. This is a full-time work. And consequently, I have a right, like every professional, to be paid by you. I have a right. Every day, experience says I have a right to be supported by you. The Bible says I have a right. Common sense and logic says I have a right. Remember what Paul is doing. He's going to assert all these rights, and later on he will say, though I have the right, I surrender my right. Let's look at his fourth reason, why he has right. You'll find the fourth reason in verse uh, 13. This is proof from the work of Levites or priests. Verse 13 says, don't you know that those who minister about holy things live of the holy things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar? Paul says, let me give you fourth proof that I have right. I'm taking you to the work that was done by priests and Levites in the Old Testament. In Old Testament time, when you went to church and you brought your animal offering, whether it is burnt offering, peace offering, meal offering, whatever offering, what many of you may not know is, after you offer the animal, the priest would kill it. With the burnt offering, all of it is burnt up except the intestines, the uh, muscles and things of that kind. And these are given back to the offerer. Then part of it is also given to the priest. Peace offering, only a little part is burnt up. The remainder is given to the priest. And the priest takes this meat home to be given to his wife and family. If you brought meal offering, grain offering, wine, these are fruit juices, it is all given to the priest. Even the burnt offering, the skin of the animal, the hide, is given to the priest who gives it to the wife and they do leather work. Paul is arguing that in the Old Testament, the priests eat by the altar. They have enough food to support themselves. I am also, as it were, working in God's church. I have a right to be supported by the time. Then let's look at his final argument. His final argument, why he has a right, is the strongest of all. You find it in verse 14. Even so, has the Lord ordained, some of your version says, the Lord Jesus has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. And so, the judge is asking Paul, Paul, you have arrayed before me all these witnesses in Corinth to say that you are an apostle. I agree. Tell me, how come you are not supported by the tithe? And Paul says, your honor, I want to make it clear, I have every right to be supported. Every day, experience tells you I have a right. The Bible says I have a right. Common sense says I have a right. The experience of free says I have a right. And our Lord Jesus Christ has commanded that they should take care of me. Your honor, I have a right. Then the question is, yes, you have right. So how come you do not exercise this right? You find the answer 
Paul surrendering his rights in verse 12. If others be partakers of this power, this right over you, are not we rather. Nevertheless, we have not used this power. We haven't exercised our right. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel. you find the same point in verse 15. But I have used none of these. you find this in verse 18, the last part of verse 18. I abuse not my power in the gospel. So Paul has made a compelling case. I have a right. And if anyone takes this right away from me, I can sue them in an American court. Because he has a right. But then he says, but your honor, I have surrendered my right. I haven't used my right. I choose voluntarily to forego being paid by tithe money. And naturally, the question will be, why? And here is where the sermon is. Why surrender your right? You are going to discover at least four or five major reasons why we must surrender our right. The answer to this is found in two words, which are translated in your English Bible as lest, L-E-S-T. Lest. Let's look at these. The first occurrence of this lest is found in chapter 8 and verse 9. Chapter 8, verse 9. But take heed. What's the next word? Lest. If you have a Bible, circle this because we will come back to this. Take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. You find the next occurrence of the word lest in verse 13 of that same chapter. Chapter 8 verse 13. Wherefore if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth. What's the next word? Lest I make my brother to offend. Let's go to chapter 9 verse 12. We'll come back to this. Chapter 9, verse 12. If others be partakers of this power, this, this right over you, are not we rather, nevertheless, we have not used this power, this right, but suffer all things, what's the next word? Lest we should hinder the gospel. And then the next word, uh, occurrence, is verse 27 of chapter 9. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest... That by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. And the last occurrence of this word, lest, is found in verse 12 of chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Four usages of the word lest in the Greek is the word mepoise. Lest. This small word is going to give us the reason why we must surrender our right. Let's look at them one by one because each reason is different. Chapter 8, verse, verse 9. I'll read it and you tell me why Paul surrendered his right according to this verse. But take heed lest... By any means, this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Why are we to surrender our right? According to this verse. Sorry? So that you wouldn't be a stumbling block to a weaker believer. Let me illustrate it. In this particular context, Paul says, I have a right to go and eat meat offered to idols. But if I use my right and go in there, a weaker church member will see Apostle Paul inside a pagan temple having potluck and they will think I am worshipping idols. And that will cause a weaker believer to stumble. In today's language, you have a right to give Bible study, as a young man, to give Bible study to a young lady at midnight in her room. You have a right. 
There may be nothing going wrong between you. It may be a clean relationship. You are actually giving Bible study. You have a right to do that. But Paul says, be careful. If somebody sees the church elder or this Seventh-day Adventist going to this new believer's house at midnight to give Bible studies, it becomes a stumbling block to a weak brother. For this reason, I will surrender my right to go there at midnight to give Bible study. Are you following? You have a right to go to a discotheque to sing gospel music there to win souls for Christ. You have the right. But Paul says, be careful. If someone sees you coming out of the clubhouse, an Adventist going there, that right you have exercised becomes a stumbling block. Uh, am I making sense? Yeah. So when or why should you surrender your right? Surrender your right if exercising that right becomes a stumbling block to others. If it's clear, say amen. amen. Let's look at the second reason why you should surrender your rights. You find this in verse 13, chapter 8, verse 13. Wherefore, if meat makes my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. If you are to summarize it, what is the second reason to exercise your right, uh, to, to surrender your right? Not to offend someone. This is similar to the first one, but it is slightly different. To understand this, let me read the context to you from verse 10. If any man sees you which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Therefore, or wherefore, if meat makes my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. What Paul is saying is, look, if you will exercise your rights in this way, it can embolden somebody to sin against God. Uh, let me say it differently. You may be in the pagan temple eating the meat offered to idols. There may be a church member who is not fully converted. On Sabbath, he comes to church. And then on other days, he goes to pagan temple. If they see you in church on that day, it emboldens them in their sin. Because they say, Wow, no big deal. The church elder is also here. So it is okay to worship in pagan temples. The first example was it is a stumbling block to a weak brother. Oh no, I thought they were all Christians. Look what they are doing. I give up the faith. That is stumbling block. In the second instance, the person is already on a path of sin. And by seeing you, you embolden them in that. Uh, is that making sense? Yeah. Okay, let's say you are going to a discotheque, a party, whatever it is. When they see you in that discotheque, there is a church member who doesn't care about Christianity. Sabbath, he comes, he takes away the jewelry, he sings, you know, amazing grace. Then other days, he's out there partying. If they see you in that club, they say, there's nothing wrong with it. The church elders are doing it. The church pastor is doing it. Everyone is doing it. So what's wrong with this? You are emboldening them to sin. Are, are, are you making sense? See, you have a right to listen to rock music. Let's assume rock music is okay, okay, for the sake of argument. Let's even pretend there's nothing wrong with rock music. You have a right to listen to rock music. But Paul says, 
if your rock music, which you are bringing into the church and calling it praise worship, if that rock music would embolden a church member to go wild and lose their soul, surrender that right. Does it make sense? Listen, ladies, you have a right to dress anyhow. You can paint your lips, paint your eyelashes, pierce your nose, do whatever you want. Even you can dye your hair blue or whatever you want. You have a right. Let's assume for the sake of argument that there is even no biblical injunction against it. There is. But let's assume you have a right. Paul says, be careful. When you dye your hair blue, you flush all your fingernails. There is a church member in the church who is waffling between Christianity and worldliness. When they see you, the wife of an elder, dressed this way, they say, praise the Lord, they are all doing it, it's okay. So you are emboldening them in their sin. And Paul says, when you do this, you are sinning against Christ because you are causing that person to perish. And so Paul's argument is, I will surrender my right, first, not to be a stumbling block to a weak brother, and second, not to embolden someone to sin. Does it make sense? Yes. You see, there's a lot of fight in the church. Worship style. And sometimes, uh, because I work with students, they tell me, well, Dr. Pippin, what's wrong with this? I said, that's the wrong question. It's not what's wrong with this. It's what's right with this. You have a right to do whatever you want. Let's even assume you have a right to be a woman elder. There is no biblical support. But let's pretend you have a right. But if in exercising that right, it splits the church and causes someone to give up the faith, then it is not wise to exercise that right. Is it making sense? I am revealing to you some deep biblical teaching. If when you take it, it would solve many problems in your life, in your home, and in the church. Yes. Let's look at the third reason why we must surrender our right. you find it in chapter 9 and verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are we not rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. We haven't exercised this right, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. What is the third reason to surrender your right, according to this verse? Not to hinder the gospel. Let me illustrate it. Let's say you have a right to fight like cats and mice in the house, a husband and a wife. You have a right. You can fight all you care. But Paul says, be careful. Next week, your son and daughter, seeing how you are fighting like cats and mice, because everyone is asserting their right, they will say, I don't care about your faith. You hinder the gospel. Or let's say you are at a workplace. Somebody has hurt you so badly, say, it is my right to sue them. So you drag this poor person to court because you are asserting your right. And then Sabbath afternoon, we are going for outreach. And you take your track. I'm going to preach the gospel to this person you've been fighting with last week. You are hindering the gospel. Does it make sense? You know, many families that are in trouble, because they are fighting, sometimes when they come to me and say, okay, let's present our case. In many cases, I said, mister, Let's not even listen to her side of the story. You are right, mister. Everything you've said is right. Yes, your wife is this. She's so bad, he's a demon, or vice versa. You are right. But the Bible says, surrender your right. 
It's as simple as that. See, we waste a lot of energy sitting down. You see what he's done against me? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we, what did he do? Then we go through all of this. Ladies and gentlemen, don't waste that energy. You are right. Okay? Let's not fight about it. You are 100% right and she is 100% wrong. Paul says, surrender that right. So why waste the energy? Why waste the energy fighting? Paul says, I have everywhere. Sometimes you say, well, if, if, if I surrender my right, they will think I'm a fool. Do you think Paul was a fool? Absolutely not. This was a brilliant lawyer. He studied under the number one professor in all of Israel. Of all the apostles, Paul was the most brilliant. And he has just presented his case to the court. I have a right. This is my evidence. I call this witness. I call this witness. Your honor, I have a right. He is not a dumb fool. But he says, I surrender my right. There were some people, well, if, if you don't assert your right, they, they will think you are a pushover, a doormat. No. Jesus had rights. He wasn't a fool. But he surrendered his right. Why? Not to be a stumbling block. Second, not to embolden somebody in sin. And third, not to hinder the gospel. If that is clear, say amen. amen. The fourth reason to surrender your right. You'll find it in verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means... When I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Why should you surrender your right? According to this verse. Your own salvation is at stake. Yeah. You can be disqualified. Yeah. Yes, you are right. That brother or sister whom you helped bring into this country, got him be of green card and whatever, now he or she has defrauded you and you are willing to fight and sue them. You can fight and fight until your very salvation will be at stake. Many of us are fighting amongst ourselves because of what she did to me, because of what he did to me. And ladies and gentlemen, you can continue in this track until you would lose your salvation. Because you can't even pray. When you see them coming to church, you have to go the other way. Your salvation is at stake. And Paul says, surrender your right. Because if you insist on those rights, you can lose your salvation. Yes. Yes. And so my question is, what right are you asserting? We are not saying you don't have a right. That is not the issue. You have all the right. You can drag them to court. You can fight them. You can blow up their houses. I mean, do whatever you want. You have a right. But Paul says, be careful. Be careful. Your own salvation is at stake. And there are many of us here who are heading to destruction because we are saying, I will never forgive her. I will never forgive him for what he did to me. So husbands and wives they are not willing to forgive. And then there are some young ladies. I use young ladies because I see that a lot. A man promised to marry you. He wasted all your time. You waited. And then they hurt you. Besides wasting your time, sometimes they took advantage of you, causing you, leaving you in a life of shame and pain and guilt. And it hurts so badly, you said, I will never forgive. Ladies and gentlemen, unless you are willing to forgive, it would eat away your own salvation. And so the apostle says, surrender your rights. Someone has defrauded you. 
someone has spoken ill about you, you know, ruined your reputation, falsely accused you, and you have every right to deal with that person the way you want. Yes, you have that right, but be careful. You can lose your salvation. Am I speaking to somebody here? What's the fifth reason to surrender your rights? You find this in chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he falls. What Paul is basically saying, look, you are on slippy slope. Rights are like they are so fragile. It's like an Ashanti king. When um, our church president visited Ghana, the king of the Ashantis gave a gift to the president. The gift was a carving of a man's hand holding an egg. And so the king gave this to the president. And because the president comes from America, many Westerners do not appreciate African sculpture, African carvings. So he just looked there and admired it. He had no clue that that carving had a meaning. And so one of the church leaders there pulled the coat of the president and said, ask the king what this carving means. And when he did, the king said, I was waiting for you to ask. He said, this is a carving of a man's hand holding an egg. The egg is a symbol of power. It is a symbol of life. You can use anything which is precious. If you don't hold it carefully, it falls from your hand and breaks. But if you hold too tightly to it, it breaks in your hand. And then the king said, go and think about it. The message, power or life is fragile. Handle it with care. In the same way, the Apostle Paul may be saying, rights are fragile. Handle it with care. You may be walking on a slippery slope. He that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he falls. Surrender your right. This message applies to everything we can think about. You have a right, madam. Sir, it is your right. But be careful. Be careful. Surrender your rights. Because if you don't do so, you are on slippery slope. And before you are aware, you are gone. Why did the Apostle Paul do so? After he presented his case. Let me just read this to you and then I'll wrap up. I want you to look at the ultimate reason why Paul surrendered his right. I mean, think about it. Here is the Apostle Paul. During the daytime, he will work his whole heart out, ministering to the people. And in the night, when everyone was asleep, Paul would take a piece of uh, needle and then be working on his tent to raise money to feed himself. Even though he had every right to be supported, he forsook all of this. Why did he do so? And meanwhile, his opponents were attacking him, defaming his character, undermining his work. And yet Paul says, I surrender. Why did he do so? Look at verses, uh, I'll just read verse 19 onwards. Though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself a servant unto all, that I might gain. The more, notice the phrase, that I might gain. Verse 20. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being without law to God, but unto the law to Christ, that I might gain. Have you noticed the phrase? That I might gain, that I might gain. Look at verse 22. To the weak I became as the weak, that I might gain the weak. I made I made all things to all men that I might by all means save others. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason to surrender your rights is for the salvation of one soul. Amen. Love is the reason. The reason Jesus surrendered his rights 
is for love's sake, so that he might gain the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave, that whosoever believed should not perish. The reason to surrender your rights, love, to save souls. So if someone defrauds you of your computer or your $2,000, if surrendering those items will lead to that person's salvation, surrender that right. Amen. Now, is it easy to surrender rights? No. In fact, the text, and I've put it in your notes, it is not easy. In verse 25, he says, And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. The phrase, every man that striveth, in the original language is one word, is the Greek word agonizomai. Some of your versions says, everyone running a race. The word race in the Greek is agon, from which we get the word agony. But whatever way you translate it, the word agony, agonizomai means it is painful. It isn't easy to surrender your right. When someone has defrauded you and you look in, your, in the person's face and say, for Christ's sake, I forgive you. It isn't easy. But you do so. When Jesus surrendered his right, every day he was provoked. Was it easy? No. When Paul surrendered his right, was it easy? No. So Paul is not, the Bible is not saying surrendering your rights is easy. It is an agonizing experience, but it is worth it. Another expression he uses, you find in verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. The phrase, I keep under my body, I put it in your notes there, hupopiazo, basically means under the eye. In today's language, Paul is saying, I will literally suffer a black eye. I would rather be hurt than lose my salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, surrender your rights. It hurts. It is painful. But it is worth everything. Amen. And so in your handout, on the back... I, I list some things, quite frankly, time would not allow. But let me call your attention to the key question on the, uh, uh, just about below halfway on the left-hand column. What rights must you give up today in your personal life, in your home, in your church, in your workplace? Jesus didn't come to insist on his rights. He took our wrongs so that he might Save, we might live. Pride or unrenewed self is often the reason we seek to assert our rights. When you say, I have to insist on my rights, if you analyze it carefully, it is more often than not our self that is speaking. Some final thoughts. Paul was not weak or stupid when he chose not to exercise his rights. The reason he surrendered his right was he was dead to self. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ. Self was dead. And I have put there in your notes what it means to die to self. In the case of Paul, Paul had no ambitions for himself. And so he had nothing to be jealous about. See, the reason we are jealous is because we have ambition, self. He had no reputation, and so he had nothing to fight about. The reason we fight is because we are trying to preserve my reputation. Me, self, I. But when self is dead, you have nothing to fight about. He had no possessions, and therefore he had nothing to worry about. Because when you read Philippians 3, he has suffered the loss of all things for the sake of Christ. So he had nothing to, to, to worry about. He had no rights. So therefore, he couldn't suffer wrong. The reason we suffer wrong is because we think someone is taking our rights away. But when you surrender your rights, you don't suffer wrong anymore. The person does this to you, as Jesus would say, when they strike you on the cheek, you turn the other. 
When they defraud you of one coat, you give them the other. When they bid you go one mile, you go the second mile. Quite frankly, this is the easiest way to live. Many of us have no peace because we are so determined holding on to our rights. He was already broken, so no one could break him. He was dead, so no one could kill him. He was less than the least, so who could humble him? I mean, if you are already down, can anyone humiliate you? How low can you go when you are the least of the least? He was the least, so no one could humble him. He has suffered the loss of all things, so none could defraud him. Do, do you understand? Yes. This is the secret of living a life of freedom. So someone would do something to you, you just stand there and shake your head. Not because you can't hit them back, but because a compelling reason has led you to surrender your right. This is the secret to save your home. To bring back peace in your life and harmony between you and others. The hurt, the pain, the disappointment, the broken heart, the broken home, and all the experiences you've gotten, this is the biblical key. Amen. Self dies, and with it, your rights die. Therefore, no one can hurt you anymore. When you go home, read the other statements. Jesus did not contend for his rights. And she goes on to tell us, every day his life was made unbearable and difficult, even by his friends, but he never insisted on his rights. Christians shouldn't contend for their rights. I know you say, does it mean I shouldn't ever stand up for my rights? No, that's not my point. As a matter of fact, I put in your nose when it is appropriate to exercise your right. Time would not allow me uh, because it is time already. But if there had been time, I would have shared with you when it is right to exercise your right. Perhaps, actually, Paul goes on to tell us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 31 to chapter 10, uh, he tells us when to, ex to exercise our right. Uh, but for lack of time, I'll just skip it. All I want to leave with you this hour is simply this. Whatever hurt, whatever pain you have suffered and are going through, for Christ's sake, surrender those rights. And you discover joy and peace in your life. Is this something you want to do? Amen. If so, why not stand for prayer? How do you surrender your right? It is simply a decision you make. It's a decision. When we say surrender, 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 all it means is make up your mind. Last night we said, let this mind be in you. Jesus made up his mind. He made a choice. And by standing up, you are basically saying, Lord, this day, I'm making up my mind. I'm making a decision. It is a conscious, voluntary decision that whatever I have suffered, whatever he or she is doing, whatever my coworker or colleague is doing to me, for Christ's sake, this day, I've decided to let go. To let go. That's the choice you are making. Perhaps I should make a little specific appeal. We hardly do this, but I think it is fitting. There may be somebody here this hour who has been truly hurt. We need not go into what caused the hurt. And prior to today, perhaps you have been saying, I will never forgive, because it hurt so badly. But you want to say, Lord, Today, I let go. Yes. I surrender. If you are in that group, I would invite you to come forward for special prayer. 
Or it could be a family. You are fighting. You don't want to give up. And you can easily even file for a divorce. You know what is going on. But you are also saying, Lord, I surrender. Just come up for it. Whoever the Lord has been speaking to, this is a decision. Self must die. Christ must reign. And ladies and gentlemen, you don't know what this means. Because to be hurt really hurts. Sometimes your reputation has been ruined. You've been defrauded, disgraced, seriously wounded. And right now, you want to say, Lord, for your sake, I surrender. I don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. I don't want my actions to embolden anyone to sin or to be a hindrance to the spread of the gospel. I don't want to lose my salvation. I know I'm on sleepless rope. Lord, for your sake, this hour I'm surrendering. Is anyone else coming? This may be the decision you would make that will set you free. I would invite you to come for this special prayer session. Brother Roberts, I would invite you to come and lead us in this special prayer. As he comes, Lord, is there anyone else whom the Lord has been speaking to in a very clear way? And you know you have to make that decision right now. Is anyone else coming before we pray? If not, let's bow our heads. The Lord bless you. Anyone else coming? We just want to give opportunity to those who need to make this decision. That is why the Lord brought you here today. Surrender your rights. Anyone else coming? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Let me invite you to meet with me.